welcome to another episode of the House Huddle Podcast. Here are your hosts, Rob Schwartz and Justin Oniemi, two Bears fans who decided talking into a microphone was better than shouting at their television. Welcome in to episode 51 of the Havis Huddle Podcast. Huddle, Huddle up! up! That that new intro, boy. Yeah, Whoa. it got me pumped. <laughs> <laughs> that Huddle Up had some, some juice. It did. It did. You know, we're constantly <clears throat> wanting to build, constantly trying to grow, and uh, I've been playing with some stuff off, off screen and trying to do a few new things, and uh, we got some new graphics That's to throw good, at man. you guys. Love so. it. Love it. Uh, that's appropriate for 51 yeah. Hall of Fame player. So hopefully that's a Hall of Fame intro right there. We got a leeway, like a leadway into three really big episode numbers, right? That's true. So. That's true. I didn't even say the name because I figure everyone knows, but obviously it's the Dick Butkus episode. That's right. If it's anything else to you, I'm sorry you're not a Chicago Bears. Fan. <laughs> Just plain and simple. And well, and we were even wondering, like, we didn't even look up any other 51s, but yeah, I was asking you off air. Like in the preseason, even do they sometimes let these guys wear the legendary numbers? But nah, not the big ones. They should just to like some guy you know is going to get cut. Yeah, just make it different, <laughs> right? Rudy, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's also fitting because he's a defensive player, right? And this is our episode that we're going to talk about the defense. That's right. We did an episode with offensive position groups comparing the 2022. Uh, positional groups or the rooms yeah. to what it's going to look like this year. And now we want to do the same thing for the defense. But before we do that, and I, you know, we waited, you and I waited, we didn't want to do the we defense did. right away. We're like, hopefully there's going to be someone added to this defense that will change the script. And sure enough, yeah. that did happen. And if you're listening to this on as a podcast, right. And not watching it on YouTube. You will note that there was an episode that actually took place in between this episode, our episode 50. We we decided we were going to make that a big episode also, but we kind of, no offense to Will DeWitt, okay, of CHGO. We wanted to bring him on. He was the first guy that I thought of when I thought about doing an interview. But we were trying to stall, right, to, to see if they would <laughs> add a defensive right. player. So we wanted to throw that episode in between the offensive one and the defensive one. So now we're here. And the reason that episode's missing from the Straight Up podcast is it was a live broadcast. Yes. And for some reason, we can't figure out how to get those to we will get there. go to podcast. I, but... I'm, I will figure it out one day. <laughs> all right. Well, it wasn't last week or whenever that was. So that's yeah. all right, though. Great guest. Great episode. So if you do listen only to the podcast, go ahead and go to YouTube. Yes. Watch that episode and then you'll find you'll get a little hooked and you can start watching episodes uh, on YouTube as well. And one thing to point out too is that it was our 50th episode. We also announced our next giveaway. So if you're new to that podcast or you're just hearing it for the first time, uh, we are giving away a Justin Fields jersey. Okay. Completely free. You're going to be able to pick which color you want or which design, whatever, as long as it's within the same price range. And your size and so forth. We're going to buy it. We're going to send it to you. Boom. The only catch is we need to get to 750 subscribers. I know it's a tall ask, yep. but this is a big item. We got some work to do. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, the excitement is already building for the Bears, and hopefully that leads to some excitement for Hallis Huddle as well. Well, I will say they signed a player. And within 24 hours, I sold some of my Chicago Bears season tickets. So go. clearly guys are excited. That's Women right. possibly too. I mean, I don't want to like gender stereotype. Fans are excited, right? And uh, I guess that just brings us right yeah, to it. Yeah, let's right? talk about it. All right. So welcome to the Chicago Bears. Oh, let's just go with it. Let's yeah. welcome to the <laughs> Chicago Bears. Are you ready? Yannick Nagakwe. Yes. So I was kind of thinking about what this reminds me of. And obviously your mind might go to like a Khalil Mack, but there's a distinct difference there. Okay. Bears had to give up assets to get Khalil Mack in a trade situation. Yes. And then sign him to a massive deal long-term that he didn't end up seeing the whole time uh, through. Whoop. 
<laughs> but I then started thinking, okay, what are some other comps? Maybe if you've been a Bears fan long enough, you remember Adewale Ogunle. There we go. That's a good comp. The Prince. Um, exactly. Now, he had production prior to, came around his prime. But again, that was a long-term deal. I actually like that this is a short-term deal. It's a one-year, $10.5 million. go to another team yeah um so then the last comparison and he even mentioned this guy in his press conference is julius peppers okay now peppers was more established older when he came over yep um and i believe is a much more complete player yes because nagakwe does have some holes in his game we've talked about it in previous podcasts i'm sure we'll mention it again here um but it's a game changer not just for the defensive line room but pretty much the whole team yeah i mean it's like that effect that he's gonna bring to that front seven now you're gonna have him to a, that you're gonna have to worry about double teaming when trevis gibson was your guy who was being double teamed and i know we'll talk about that a little bit but now the next guy up is gonna have less on him so it's gonna should be easier on him to get to the quarterback it's it's just like a, an effect that goes trickle down effect that just like goes down the the whole depth chart but it helps the people behind him too and yep. and I'm glad you brought the Cleo Mac thing because it definitely gives that feeling of the same energy. But like you said, there's no draft capital that they're giving up. They're literally giving him a one-year $10.5 million contract. And I know a lot of people, and especially Packer fans, are going to say, oh, well, this is his, what, sixth team in seven years, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I actually didn't know this, and I have to give cre- credit where oh, – I can't give credit where to do Adam Hogue was talking about this the other day, and I can't recall where he said he read it. It was an article, but it broke down the situation of Yannick, by the way. I guess it's Yannick. Oh, okay. We've been, I've been saying it wrong the whole time. My I always thought it was Yannick, but it's Yannick. Um, the last thing we got correct, though. Apparently in Jacksonville, and I don't recall this, he got basically traded – because he got into a Twitter war with the the owner's son or the GM's son or something like that. So, boom, that was a big thing there. Now, is that professional? Obviously not. But then he goes to Oakland, okay? That was the Gruden year. Mm-hmm. Whole new regime, mm-hmm. right? Then he goes to Indianapolis. That's a whole new regime. And these were trades, right? Uh, well, one Indianapolis was... was not. Oh, Baltimore. He was in Baltimore at one point, too. So, so some of them were due to trades, and that my point of bringing that up is somebody wanted him correct, and had to give up assets for him. Now, there, I do think that's a factor, that he's played for so many teams, um, but it's a prove-it deal. They didn't yes. lock him up long-term. So yes. he's got to show either for the Bears to re-sign him or someone else. And based on his track record, I mean, he, he's one of only, I think, five players in NFL history to have eight sacks in their in his first seven seasons. Right. Um, the other names on that list are like Reggie Wayne or uh, <laughs> Reggie White. Sorry, not Reggie Wayne. That'd be impressive. Uh, Reggie White, Demarcus Ware. I don't know all. De- uh, Derek Thomas. Okay. Derek Thomas. Um, yep. I mean, these are some You're legendary names, names that he's with. So I'm excited. Oh, what I was going to say is prior to them signing, everyone kept saying, hey, the Bears still need to sign an end. They still need to sign an end. They still need to sign an end. Everyone knew. Now you sign him, that makes the DeMarcus Walker signing so much better, too. Exactly. Because now, like, that was their move before. Exactly. And he's versatile. He can play end. He can go inside. They're going to have more options. It's really exciting. Yeah. So, like you were saying, the one – so he's played seven years, okay, eight sacks or more in every single season. I mean, this – he he's not going to be your prototypical three-down guy because he can't uh, stop the run as well. But you get him in on a rotation, which is what Matt Eberflus likes anyway. He doesn't like his guys hitting more than 65% of the snaps. I think it's a great fit. I think he's going to do well here. I'm excited to see it. I hope he proves it enough where they can even bring him back. And, you know, then they draft his replacement. There you go. And they brought in other guys specifically to stop the run. Right. So everyone's going to know their role, know what they're there to do. I'm sure. Well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I'm guessing he still does it better than Dominique Robinson was yes. last yeah. year. So, and that's a guy who can then learn from someone like Yannick 
Nagakwe. So why don't we talk about the effect this is going to have on the whole defensive line room. And I'm sorry. I'm apologizing to the listeners and viewers right now because I'm going to have to remind you what the defensive line was <laughs> last year. <laughs> when I was doing my research, it, it brought me down a bit, Rob. It really did. It's almost as bad as the wide receiver group. <laughs> yes. So if you remember from our offensive episode, we're going to rank them on a scale to 10. Oh, oh man. What did you put for the defensive line? Let me first say, we're just giving you at their peak. Um, because obviously a guy like Robert Quinn started in that room right. and by midseason was traded from the team. Uh, but here are some of the names that were in that defensive line room. And if we want to break it up by defensive ends and detect defensive tackles, yeah, I'll give you that. Let's go ends first. Okay. So defensive ends, we had Robert Quinn, Travis Gibson, El Quadin Muhammad, and Dominique Robinson as your main core of defensive ends. Defensive tackles, Justin Jones, Angelo Blackson, Mike Pennell, and Armand Watts. Yeah, so out of that group, um, not a lot of names outside of Robert Quinn, who had a very down year, and people predicted it. I didn't think it was going to do it. I didn't think it was going to happen that way, but people said he's he's an every-other-year guy, and mm-hmm. sure as shit, he yeah. 18 and a half sacks one year and one and a half the next, so... Yeah. Well, and the year prior to that was low. Right. It was his and first year, year with the Bears. Yeah. yeah. So. He is an, it seems to be an every-year player. Uh, he's a different type of cat, but I don't think he, like, it's not an effort thing. I just, whatever it is, it's an every-other-year thing for him. Um, now, he's a veteran. I'm sure he added value to that room through his experience and knowledge sure. and things like that, but we did not see it in the results on the field. This was one of the worst defensive lines well, it was one of the worst ones in the league, if not the worst in the league. But I'm even saying they were historically bad. Yeah, They couldn't stop the run. They couldn't pressure the quarterback. And, I mean, those, that's what you're there to do. Right. Both those things. They couldn't do either one. And I would even say when teams moved the pocket, they weren't good at that either. It was a bad group. Uh, I, 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 I gave it a three. Okay. I said it was a three, and then I downgraded it to a two. Okay. Kind of like when Quinn left. I mean, now you even lost sure. that guy. So sure. it became a two for me. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, Travis Gibson was probably the best left of that group. Led the, led the unit with three sacks, but still not good enough. Still didn't beat out the rookie safety. No. <laughs> so, uh, so. Well, where it, are we at it's, now? It's not, exactly. It's not hard to see that, obviously, this year we believe what they have going in is going to be an improvement. Right. But just how big of an improvement? Why don't you just talk about some of the guys that are going to be in the room this year. Yeah, so we already talked about Yannick Nagakwe, right? Like, huge upgrade right there, even over Robert Quinn because of the consistency of being able to get to the quarterback. Uh, Demarcus Walker was brought in on a three-year deal. Okay, so he's on the opposite side. Travis Gibson is now your rotational guy like he was before when it was Mack and Quinn. He had seven sacks that year, so hopefully that helps him be able to get to the quarterback a little bit easier. Uh, right now we got Rasheen Green, Dominique Robinson, a guy we keep hearing about in camp, Terrell Lewis, or Terrell Lewis, I'm sorry. Um, and then a couple UDFAs, DeAnthony Jones and Jalen Harris, who I actually did a Bear Goggles on article recently where I ranked who was going to be released first, <laughs> going down to who would be kept. And uh, yeah, both of those guys I don't see making the final roster. So I think we can just push them to the side. Um, last year they kept four ends and four tackles in the tackle position. We brought in my guy, the big man, Andrew Billings, right there in the middle. Justin Jones right now is still your, your, uh, leading three tech. Uh, I know you're a big Justin Jones guy. They drafted Jervon Dexter, who has a lot of potential, has not lived up to the getting, being able to get off the ball faster at this point according to reports uh even though he's not playing that uh two gap scheme like he was That's not really what i've been hearing but i honestly have not been following it as closely i would say yeah and part of that will come up in our next episode i want to speak to that a little bit um now i'm wondering you say keep four ends and four tackles yeah there are some interesting names then that might not be making this team yeah and i know that's not what this episode's about no but we need to keep that in mind but that even shows you 
that now you're to a point where there's competition, the depth, there's depth, and this is really good progress uh, from a team and from a unit that was horrible on a team that was three and fourteen. And I apologize because I have been not paying close enough attention over the last twenty four to thirty six hours, but Demarcus Walker got hurt, and then they signed Nagakwe. So I don't know if it was just a coincidence that it happened so closely, or you know. Matt Everflus has got these undisclosed injuries. Won't talk about any of them. Uh, we had the same situation last year with uh, Lucas. Pat- we had a little bit more information last year, but then it's like, you know, Lucas Patrick's thumb. We thought he was coming back, and it was like took forever. Uh, so when it comes to this, like maybe Walker isn't going to be able to start the season. I don't know. I maybe he was out there yesterday or at, at or today at uh, Family Fest. I I didn't pay enough attention, but. So, oh, and Travis Bell, I didn't mention him. He'll probably make the practice squad. Yeah. Zach so, Pickens. Zach Pickens. <laughs> Throw that extra C in there. <laughs> so, um, we had them at a two or a three out of 10. Yeah. With this new crop of uh, individuals, almost no carryover, really. Yeah. No. Very little, anyway. Um, where do you think they are and where do you think they can be? This is probably because my it's all hope at this point, it's all excitement at this point. I'm going from, the, uh, for me, a three all the way to a seven. I also put them at a seven. And even if they stay right there, think about that vast amount of improvement. Um, but the reason I wanted to go that high up, the billing signing, along with the, what they did in the draft, I feel was meant to address the rush game. Yeah. Up the middle, especially. And really, when you do that, and we're not at the linebacker part yet, I could see this whole defense clicking a lot better if you start by stopping the run a bit better than they did because teams were doing whatever they wanted last year, and that's why the unit was completely ineffective. Um, well, what's really important with their scheme is gap control, right? And I know you're alluding to where the, where the linebackers get to I, – I can't really give it away without giving it away, but they're able to be free, right? They're able to pick and choose their gaps a little bit more. They do have assignments, obviously – but there was no gap control, especially on containment, even with like guys with Robert Quinn, like <laughs> yes. so many times, but like Dominique Robinson, for example, could not contain the whole season. It was, he would became a liability. Well, and, let's not forget that he came in, he was a rookie last year and was played what receiver, receiver. or something. He was, he was <laughs> Reggie Wayne. Prior, <laughs> Reggie Wayne. It's to, you tried to turn Reggie Wayne into Reggie White in one year. So we see that doesn't work. Uh, hopefully a year or more of experience helps him in that regard. And with other guys ahead of him in the depth chart, maybe his role is just come in on those rush downs and go for the guy. Yeah. Um, but he's more of a depth piece at this point. Whereas last year you were pretty much depending on him. Right. That's that's not uh, not acceptable. So I also had them at a seven. That's a huge improvement. Will they get there? You know, if Demarcus Walker isn't in, in the equation, if he's if his injury is more serious, sure, that changes my number. Um, but just the fact that we can see it go that far, far is major progress. Kudos to Ryan Poles. Will it all work out? We don't know. But he certainly put that that positional group in a much better position. Yeah. So just to allude to what I wrote, by the way. So obviously Nagakwe and Walker are my locks. Travis Gibson, I do think, is obviously a lock unless they figure out a way to trade him. And I, I can't see that his trade value is high enough. Um, I don't have Rasheen Green making this team. He was signed to a one-year deal. Like you, you bring in Nagakwe, he co- instantly pushes him down. And you're hearing things about guys like Terrell Lewis, and I mean they're going to obviously want to keep Dominique Robinson, guy. right? So yeah. unless they're willing to put Robinson on the practice squad and hope no one claims him, I just don't see Green making this final roster. Or they're going to end up keeping five ends and four tackles. And, you know, give up somewhere else. Give up somewhere else. Yeah. That's a whole nother episode. Uh, yeah, we got to do a 53 man at some point. We will. Let's get a few preseason games yeah, yeah, in. Yeah. That, that what, definitely will help. You know, I mean, look at Jack Sanborn last year in right? preseason game number one. That really changed the Hall of Famer. That's right. <laughs> Best case scenario. All right. So, started with the line. That's where everything starts. And that's where everything ended last year yes. for the defense. But now we mentioned it. What's that next unit going to look like? So you back it up to the linebackers. Obviously, last year, I don't have to remind Bears fans, uh, your number one guy at linebacker was Roquan Smith. 
You also had Nicholas Mar Morrow, who was a consistent contributor. Jack Sanborn came on, and part of that was after Roquan left. Let's not forget that. Oh, but yeah. I put them in together. Uh, you had guys like Joe Thomas, Matthew Adams as well. So that was last year's unit. How did you rank them? Roquan's a top five player in the league. For me, he's a top three linebacker. I still think he's a top three linebacker. It sucks that he's not here from a talent standpoint. Um, I don't think the scheme is particularly best for him. I think he fits better in Baltimore. Uh, I think he'll get better recognition being in Baltimore. So you're going to see him probably get those Pro Bowl nods and stuff now going forward. Things that we didn't see here in Chicago. Uh, but outside of Roquan Smith and then like the emergence of Jack Sanborn, but he missed what the last five, six games. I gave it a five. So I had them at a six and I said they were probably a seven when Roquan was there. I mean, you remember, and yeah. again, they only won three games. Yeah. And the Houston game, Roquan put the whole team on his back and was a key reason they even pulled that one out. Yes. Um, so I'm not saying, oh, had they kept him or all that stuff. I'm just saying when he was there, that elevated them a lot more. However, I think him leaving did allow for Jack Sanborn to kind of have the type of uh, explosion onto the scene that he did end up having. So I have him kind of at like a six, seven range. Let's give him a six though. Okay. And you had five. So. I had a five. Yep. And and I was also taking into account, you know, Roquan missed half the season. Yep. San God, San God, Sanborn <laughs> missed a good chunk of the end of the season as well. So at one point you got Joe Thomas and Nicholas Morrow yeah, out there. Yeah, that's true. Like, I mean, it's rough. It, it was. And, and it's what's difficult with what we're doing right now, too, is because we're projecting health for this season, right? And that's why I keep going back to just in the room. Yeah. Because if a guy who's your stud gets hurt, he's still there. He's still experienced. He's still, right. you know, coaching it, from the sideline in a sense. We know this is a next man up, you, you know, mentality league. Of course. So if yep. you don't have the depth. Right. You're good right. Luck. And that's where I think this team was really hurting last year is what we're kind of seeing as the pattern. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things that really has improved. Um, and I would echo that when we go through the linebackers for this year. Yeah. So obviously they let Roquan go, got draft capital for him. So fantastic. Ryan Poles. Um, You weren't going to sign him to a $20 million contract. So you give Tremaine Edmonds and TJ Edwards, basically the same amount of money. And, I'm not going to put Tremaine Edmonds in the same category as Roquan Smith, but he's a top 10, top eight linebacker in this league. And I think he fits the scheme better to the point where he could propel into that top five. If, if he reaches the the level that we, you know, he, we obviously Matt Eberflus and his staff think that he can in this system. Um, TJ Edwards. I mean, had a fantastic season last year for uh, the Eagles. And <laughs> that pushes Jack Sanborn down the depth chart. Now he's basically your Sam who only plays, you know, 15, 20% of the snaps. And, you know, he's coming off an injury. Noah Sewell, mm -hmm. who was a first round grade in 2022, had a rough 2023 season. Um, I'm sorry, 2021 going to the 2022 draft, 2022 season going to the 2023 draft. And he could even push Sanborn for that position. Um, the other names we got, Dylan Cole, Buddy Johnson, Micah Bakersville, Baskerville. I'm sorry, I can't read. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> he's not making I don't the roster. I need to remember it. Um, so I want to go back to what you said about Tremaine Edmonds. And I'm not even saying, is he better than Roquan? I don't. I don't really get into that too too much, but for this system, he fits perfectly. And he's been a very durable player. Like I know we can't project health and weird things can happen and that sucks and that's part of the game. Um, but he has proven to be very durable. Um, Going to get you 100 tackles, great in coverage, as is TJ Edwards. Um, and so when you start to kind of see how this could fit together in this unit, in this room, I think it's an upgrade from even where they were last year at their peak. So I have this group at a potential of an 8 out of 10. 
I, I'm actually, I agree with you. I think they're in eight as well. Yeah. Seems like you wanted to. I was gonna say I there. was gonna say seven, and then okay. after hearing us talk it out, I bumped it up. Well, and I don't want to overvalue Sanborn too much, knowing that he was an undrafted uh, free agent. So was T.J. Edwards. So was T.J. Edwards, though, from the same school. Yes. So like, there's more to it than that. Um, tackles sometimes aren't as key of a stat when, when you look at like. Maybe that's because no one else is there making <laughs> right. any tackles. Um, but I think he's a solid player. I think Noah Sewell's a good addition as well. And truly, I think Tremaine Edmonds and TJ Edwards are going to take a bulk of the snaps at can, the linebacker position. Can I just throw in one thing? For anyone who doesn't think that Roquan Smith is great, um, just because he's no longer in a Chicago Bears uniform, let's not be the, that team. Let's not be that fan base, okay? The guy was fantastic here. He was fantastic in Baltimore. We had him in fantasy multiple seasons. His tackles for loss, go look that stat up because he's like one of the best in the league every year. And those things we weren't getting from right. Jack Sangod. He was a good fantasy player down the stretch. Too, he was though, as well because tackles rack up. Until he got hurt. But tackles for losses are better points. <laughs> All right. So moving further back and now we're in our defensive backfield yes um i do think that they were the strength of the 2022 defense but <laughs> we're that's not, not saying much. a whole lot that's not saying a whole lot um but to remind people and, and honestly the names haven't changed as much at this position correct um but at corner you have jaylon johnson kyler gordon kindle vildor and then by the end of the season by the way it did get kind of mm-hmm. ugly there but you had Jalen Jones, Josh Blackwell all contributed um, a good deal last season. And at safety, Eddie Jackson, Jaquan Brisker, DeAndre Houston Carson, that's a key subtraction from this year's team, Elijah Hicks, and Dane Crookshank. Crookshank. I thought he was going to be a bigger impact. Yeah. He, he dealt with injuries as well. He did. Yeah. Not, not a horrible starting group. I just don't think the depth was there, and I think we saw that at the end of the year. And it's also one of those things when your front seven has the least amount of sacks in the NFL, uh, can't even pressure a quarterback. You're not going to see the, the takeaways from the interceptions. You're not going to see them. You you can only hold, you know, Justin Jefferson and, uh, Stefan Diggs. I'm trying to think of all the people they play. AJ Brown, like yeah, (laughs) Christian Watson, you could only hold them and cover them for so long. Right. Yep. So, I'm, I'm glad you also brought up QB pressures because kind of like you said uh, with tackles or st- statistics like that, sacks are great, obviously, but sometimes you're not going to get the sack, but a pressure can be just as important or even better because it might lead to a turnover. We but saw, they weren't getting any of that either. We saw one in the Nguakwe video that I had posted. Right. Like it all, should have been intercepted. And yeah, the guy just dropped stone it. hands. Yeah. If he had hands, he'd be a receiver. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so – what did you have that unit rated last year? Yeah, it's a five for me because I loved what I saw out of Brisker in his first year. I've always – I'm a huge Eddie Jackson fan. I He had a great recovery year last year. Statistically, fans were back on his side once again. Unfortunately, he got hurt. Um, I, I don't hate Kendall Vildor. Kyler Gordon had an up-and-down season, came on strong the last few weeks. Uh, we're seeing it, hearing it a little bit in camp now. We'll talk about that in our next episode. Um, Jalen Johnson is a shutdown corner without his takeaways. So, yeah, I it's like a five-and-a-half. I'm almost at a six. I had them at a seven. Okay. But kind of like – The opposite going, of me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Kind of going towards the six. But I blamed more of that on the ineptitude of the other units. Sure. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then by the time the end of the season was rolling around, Eddie Jackson was out, yep. and you know they were dealing with injuries. Obviously, they they weren't a seven at that point. Um, <clears throat> but as I look at this year, you know Jalen Johnson is still your guy, but now he's in a contract season, so he's got lots to prove. And one of the biggest areas I think he could show that growth is to intercept a few balls. Yeah. Um, Huge potential in the draft pick of Tyreek Stevenson uh, because right now he's slated to kind of be the starting corner opposite of Jalen Johnson, which moves Kyler Gordon into the nickel, 
which I think might be his better position. So I actually thought he played better on the outside. So let's ro- really okay, quick. Sorry, you mentioned going. a couple of the people. So a lot of the names didn't change. We've already said that, yep. right? So Jalen Johnson is your, your starting outside corner. We're trying to figure out who the other starting corner is, but Tyreek Stevenson or Terrell Smith uh, might be that. Mm-hmm. They're, they're fighting it out right now, right? Kyler Gordon's been moved into the nickel spot, specifically the nickel spot. That's all he's working on. He's not playing both positions, and I think that's key. Mm-hmm. He's not having to play the outside, then move to the nickel when they go to nickel, right, where that's what he did last season. He's just playing nickel. Um, you still got Eddie Jackson coming off the injury, but seems to be healthy. Uh, and you still got Jaquan Brisker, who's obviously coming off a solid year. Hopefully he takes even another step. Uh, Kendall Williamson, Elijah Hicks, Kendall Vildor, like they're all there. Um, Jalen Jones is still here. Uh, the rest of them, not even going to worry about talking. Greg Stroman. I actually like kind of like Greg Stroman. We'll see if he can make the final roster, maybe the practice squad. Um, oh, and Joshua Blackwell's still here too. Yeah. A lot of the same. I know. Names. I mean, I don't when he gets to the final 53, it's not gonna be all these guys, obviously. Right, but they I think they usually keep between seven and nine. I doubt as high as nine, but I, I do yeah. between both. Corner know, we're, and we're talking about how the D line might have an extra guy they need to keep. Right. That right. means you got to sacrifice somewhere else. I mean, just but. looking at last year, they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They had ten. Uh, but I don't think at all at any one point they had all those guys. Sure, that's yeah. fluctuating. Right, right? Right, right. Pulling guys off practice squad, putting guys back on practice squad. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, that that was the key point that I wanted to make was with when it came to. Kyler Gordon, I do think the fact that he's able to solely focus on one position and not have to come in as a rookie mm-hmm. and have to play both. It's a lot to ask. That's we're seeing, like I said, we're hearing in camp that it's it's making a big impact. So I had them at a seven-ish, but kind of on the downside. I think this can be an eight unit. Okay. Um, I think Brisker and Gordon having another year to develop. And like you said, Gordon just being able to focus on one thing in the slot in the nickel is big. I think the fact that they believe Stevenson, like if you compare Stevenson to Gordon, I think they think Stevenson's a better prospect. Yeah. So you're plugging him in. Um, they like what they have even out of Terrell Smith as well. Um, I'm not going to buy into Eddie Jackson saying he's going to have the greatest season of safety he's ever had or something. Who would, what that? would that be? Didn't he do that in 2018? I guess. <laughs> so he'll just revert back to his old self. I, I was trying to think what that meant because he's not a Troy Polamalu type, or I didn't know. I can't think of what the greatest safety season was. Seven touchdowns for <laughs> re- return touchdowns. Mike, that's a Mike Brown season. That's an Eddie Jackson season. He did ba- what? Four back of to them. Ba- Mike Brown back to back touchdowns to win, win overtime games. games. Yeah. That's pretty, I was at the Browns. That'll game. never happen again. It was crazy. We we were actually I have to fully admit we were actually walking out of the stadium because they ended up like they were losing that game. And then, like, tied it, like, at the very end. But we were, like, getting ready to leave. And then they tied it. And then, like, we ran back down to our seats. And then we were there for the overtime. Nice. Um, and I think the other reason I have this unit slightly improving is all the improvements of the other units will help yeah. this unit. Um, if quarterbacks aren't feeling as comfortable because there's actually pressure on them and you're doing decent coverage, you're going to be in position to break passes up, hopefully pick, intercept some of these passes, um, so I think the improvements of the other units will impact this unit positively. Completely agree. And I have them at a seven with their arrow pointing up. So for me, seven, eight, seven uh, for the different positional groups and I, I or levels of positions. And I think, I don't know if this, you know, last year I predicted this team was going to be a top 10, top 15 defense. Wasn't going to see a fall off. And boy, was I wrong. Uh you know, you got to admit when you you make mistakes, and I honestly didn't think they were going to take that drastic of a fall. I didn't project that they were going to trade Khalil Mack at the same time. I didn't project they were going to trade Roquan Smith and Robert Quinn, but uh, yeah, it's just... Well, and it's not for this episode. We're about to end, but I just want to throw something out there. Iberflus was a first-year coach and brought in guys as coordinators who were first time in those positions i believe i know in the case of getsy i believe in the case of alan williams as well or did he have experience in that my point being I think he had experience i'm curious what the prior. coaching staff i mean 
No, he you was are what you're working well. with. He you was. are what you're working with. I get that aspect. But hopefully there were things that they picked up along the way sure. that are going to also help towards improvement. You also got to think Ryan Poles tore the hell out of this roster to basically not compete. <laughs> right? I mean, you're tanking to a point. You know you're not going to – you're not tanking to the fact that you think you're going to get the first overall pick. But you're tanking because you know you're going to be, like, in the bottom – 10 right. bottom 15 of the right. league right and that's basically what they did yeah well this was a defense only episode right. um when the bears did have a stretch where they were putting up 30 points a game for about four weeks i think they went zero and four in those games they because did. the defense was abysmal yeah um but as we kind of talked about in this episode we expect big improvements on defense hopefully the same on the offense and this can be a very different season than the three and 14 that we saw last year agreed if you're excited for this team hit the like button hit the subscribe button get yourself entered in to win a justin fields jersey that's all you have to do subscribe wait okay wait till we hit that mark you have a chance okay um so leave comments we haven't had a lot of comments lately uh leave comments uh we love comments i love being able to communicate with you guys i love debating things um so hit the comments, hit the likes, hit the subscribe button. Uh, this was b- it, we're covering up where it says subscribe. So uh, I didn't know if that said bribe. You know, I mean, if you well, bribe us, you might win too. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> you know, wet the whistle a little bit. <laughs> the, the podcast gets a little bit better. <laughs> no, we want you to subscribe. Um, obviously, that's a great giveaway. I wish I could win one of those. Yeah, we're not eligible. Obviously. I don't even own a Fields jersey. <laughs> That's going to have to be one, you know, Justin, Justin, I think I need to do it. I think I need to do it. All right, Rob. Yeah. It's been a a great episode as always. So uh, episode 51 is in the books. Bear down. Bear down.